much, but I okay. Now we are. I'm, now we're recording. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right. No. Okay. okay. So it, it gets you started. That's that's yeah. it. <laughs> it gets you started with these four metrics. I can also, as you freeze, I can fill in the <laughs> the gaps for you. All right. So it was it was this. I'm really sorry we didn't start the recording until now. Um, that it's just because of the background. So it's it's really this metric model um, that is present here in, in Compass Lab. And so if I was to click on, say, Kubernetes here, you can see just the single project starter uh, health metric model, in addition to, again, all of the metrics that help comprise that metrics model. So Don, hoping you don't freeze again, could you talk a little bit about the process by which, like, you first intended the, do you remember, there were like things you wanted in it, and then there was the response. Yeah, yeah so it was, it was interesting because I had originally defined time to close as um, one of the metrics in the starter project health model. And then when Yahoo and team were starting to implement it um, and talking about how they were going to implement it, I realized that um, that really wasn't what I was looking at at all. I was looking at a change request closure ratio which was a metric that we didn't have defined. And so I had to define it separately. So, so this helped me kind of think through what the right things to do because time, time to close, I think is, um, it, it varies a lot by project, right? Like really complex code bases are gonna take longer to merge pull requests. And, um, and I feel like it's not as useful as looking at the change request closure ratio, which is really kind of the number of, the number of change requests that you're closing, meaning either merge or close without merge, um, compared to the number that are that are coming in. So it's basically how well are you keeping up? Because time to close is kind of a response metric, which sort of overlapped a little bit with time to first response. So I felt like those those really it wasn't what I it wasn't what I meant um, when I said time to close. That wasn't really what I was measuring. And it wasn't until Yahoo started implementing it and asking me a bunch of questions. I was like, no, that's not what I mean at all. And he's like, well, that's kind of what time to close means. And I was like, yeah, it does. And that's not what I want anymore. I've changed my mind. Um, so it really did help me sort of think through the process of defining this um, pro you know, starter project health metrics model. And um, so it, it did uh, prompt us to redo this metrics model with a different metric. Right on. Thank you. Um, so are there questions at this point? Are there questions in the chat? There are pizza comments. <laughs> but that's that's what I got in the chat. All right. So I think, you know, what with the, if I go to the slides that Yuhui had presented these um, in the metrics model meeting, I think I think we covered a lot of things. So the idea is, is that groups like this, like the OSPO or the OSPO++ working group, or we have a science working group that are taking a look at what would be the metrics models that are potentially important in their particular context. The lab may provide an opportunity for us to see some of those in practice. I think that this, this project, um, this downstream project from chaos, and so I, to me, it, it, it is really interesting. <laughs> I think it really helped the conversation with developing the metric model. And it's really interesting, I think, to see these metrics models in, in practice. So this, the slides that I have in here just kind of describe the process by which a model would be created. This is not currently, the reason I'm showing these slides is because it's not currently available. Yeah, but the, the idea is there's a, it's an intention to have a way to, without code, create the dashboard of the things that you think belong in a model. Mm -hmm. That's how I understand it too. Yeah. So, so that's that's useful and valuable, and we don't have that elsewhere. Sophia, um, two things. One is coming back to the methodology. Where was that on the page? So I was just trying to find it. If you go to metrics models at top. So the models are what's defined versus if you look at an individual project, I'm trying to see if it shows you what things it's counting for the project. Um, so that's sort of one of my stickier points with something like this. Like I'd love to see these are the X number of repositories or specific links to oh, 
like get it everywhere. I'll just show you what they're counting because if you look at something like LFX versus other dashboards, they're not always counting the same number of repositories by that project. Mm -hmm. um, Kubernetes has four plus organizations uh, underneath that broader umbrella. So I'd be curious if they could, like, I don't know if we, is there a way to give them feedback? Or, like, is there a way that they can just show that at the, the bottom of a project? Um, the other question was how do they choose? Wait, 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 can you go, can you go back to the dashboard map? Because I think it, I think it might show us. So like you can see that this so Apache this... iceberg is a yeah. single repository. It's Apache slash iceberg. I okay. think that that's what it is. So I think when they say Kubernetes, it's Kubernetes slash Kubernetes. I think. You would think. You okay. could, go back to that one. Go to that and lab. find out. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go to the lab. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just sort of curious. Yeah. So it's Kubernetes, Kubernetes. It's a single repository. It's not a whole project. Where do you see that? At the very top, where it's got the. Oh, GitHub. I see it. There it is. Thank you. Yeah, and you can click on it. Perfect. Okay, yeah. that's that's what I wanted to see, and I missed it. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah. I guess the, the follow question is, how do we stick more projects in here? Are they open to, like, I'm assuming it's a, a SaaS tool where they're just shouldering all the infrastructure costs. So how do we, like, what you, are they? You can submit your project is the way to do it. <laughs> I didn't know, like, if there's any guidance on, like, what, like, can anyone do this? Or are they looking I for think it's a, I think it comes via, a, it's a YAML file, I think, that gets produced. On the request, Sean, or does anybody remember this? That sounds right. That that there a request would be put in some kind of queue. I don't know how it works on Compass exactly. Like if it's automatic or if there's a process for approval. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And are these? Um, is there any kind of a login functionality where I could see my repos? Looks like there is a sign in. Yeah, yeah, when you when you sign in with the GitHub, it takes it asks you permission and then it takes you to the form where you submit the repo and and then press a submit. Okay. But I don't think that they give you a separate view. I think that's just the submit your project workflow. Yes. So Which to... is a different question than what Sean was asking. Yeah answers Sophia's question, but not John's. Well, and I think it builds on, I, I'd i like to build on Sophia's question because um, like individual repositories are interesting for some projects. Um, for others, they're not particularly interesting because the, the project isn't in a mono repo, it's broken up across you know a few repositories. So I would be curious if they have any thoughts on sort of aggregating the results for multiple repositories. I mean, you can kind of get that with the, the interface as it is right now, because you can select multiple projects and compare them. So you could get like all of the, I don't know, you get 10 Kubernetes repos, for example, but, um, but you're comparing them, you're not aggregating them. So I'd be curious what they, what they think about that that question. So looking at multiple repositories versus looking at a single repository. So questions, can we aggregate repos? Yeah. Okay, like that? Yeah. Okay. And then, Sophia, did you get your question answered on submitting? Yeah, it's so it's in submitting. It just seems like it's it's generally open to anyone right now. And I'm just curious how I think submitting is open to anyone from, from what I understand. Okay. And I think the there have been questions about changing the weights on the metrics models. And the answer is no to that at the current mm -hmm. moment, just from a resource perspective. Um and I think in terms of creating a metric model, like if if like you just wanted to create one right now, the answer is also no to that. I think they would assign people that have the ability to create a model. And then Sean, your question was um, like- can, can I log in and just say, I wanna watch these 20 repos that are part of my project as an OSPO or these 11,000 repos that are part of my purview in an OSPO. Okay. I mean, that would be one useful feature, I think. Okay. Got it. Thank you. 
Um, I did want to point out, are there any other comments or questions before I just- I out? have a comment. Yeah, Luis. I think I identified a, a bug in the change request closure. Say that again. Because I think I saw a bug in the, one of the metrics. Oh. They have okay. the, the one that don't define with the name of change request closure. You go there. Because it is never above one. So the definition is close. Yeah, items. so it's, it's never above one because of the way it's um, defined. So that's actually that's actually not a bug. That's a feature, I guess. Um, the idea being that what it's looking at is the total number of pull requests that you have in a in a month, say. So if there are a hundred pull requests in that month, um, you can't close more than 100. So it's not 100 new pull requests open. It's a total of 100 pull requests that existed as open pull requests in that month. Do you see what I mean? So you can yeah. never close more pull requests than are um, open. OK. So it will, it will never be. Yeah, it will never <laughs> be more than logical. One. Well, it's not, it's not but that, it depends that on how you define it. So Luis has a yeah. really good point. If the question yeah. was the number of new pull requests that were opened and you were doing a change request uh, closure uh, metric against the new ones that were open, you would have also have old ones that were open that were kind of backlog. And you could, in that case, close more pull requests than were opened in a specific month. Um, but what I'm interested in measuring for this one is the backlog. So it's how far behind are our projects getting. So, so this will continue to go, like if you're just not keeping up, this will continue to go down and down and down um, forever, but it can never go above, above one. I get it. Then okay. we need to modify the definition because it points to the RIE from Grimmar Lab. And this, this the definition is, is different because we are using the, uh, there the same de definition as, as BMI which is a metric that comes from the software quality environment. Okay. So, and that definition is interested in, in measuring if you are able basically to, to reduce the backlog. So you're interested in the total number of PRs or issues you are able to close. So if, for instance, if you are above one, mm -hmm. uh, you are your backlog is reducing. So right. you are able to digest all the issues or PRs. If you are below one, your backlog is growing. So we, we need to, to remove that. Mm -hmm that link which which maybe we can uh, in the definition from from the metrics that uh don't create it maybe we can state the difference between the two so it is more clear one that I'm at right uh the one below yeah okay okay uh, that one. yeah yeah so it's yeah. a yeah oh, basically yes. compressing yes. it into a header behind it is quite interesting yeah. But uh, it can be confusing, so maybe we can we can mention the difference between the two. So, Luis, are you suggesting a change to this metric to accommodate what you're talking about? I can I can suggest uh, a change to That'd make sure that uh, the readers understand the difference between the two. What I would be what I would recommend, and this is what I generally recommend, is that there's a solid caption under each of the visualizations because I think I don't know that what is being represented is different, but I think it's being represented in a more clear way to answer a more specific question. And it would be helpful to caption exactly what someone's seeing here, because then I think I'm, I'm getting a different perspective that's extremely useful. On so the way the way ratio. the metrics model template works is that's actually above the visualization. So if you oh, look the, at the, the caption. Yeah. So you look at that. This is REI data from Grimoire Lab describes okay. the thing below it. Yeah, I hate markdown because it makes captioning unclear. Yeah, so it's not a caption, it's a description, yeah. and then you get the thing. So you get the description first and then the thing. Um, maybe that's, but that's across the board. That's that's part of the template for the metrics models, I think. Yeah, no, I'm sure you're right. Follow the template. Mm -hmm. um, but Luis is right. This isn't this isn't the right graphic from Grimoire Lab to represent this particular metric. So yeah, if you can if you can come up with a better one and file an issue in the this is in the common metrics working group, um, we can get this one updated. Thank you. And and I, 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 I think I think it's a different slice of the same metric. Like this is just a different view that gives you a very specific answer to the question. 
No, I think it's actually, I, I would say it's different. And okay. we're actually in the process of defining this metric, this REI, okay. because Luis, your blog post, we we kind of loved the blog post about the uh, uh, the highlighted metrics models for, for the month from Baturgia. And so we're going to define both of those, VMI and, and REI. So we have these on, on tap to, to define anyways as separate metrics. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I don't know where I'm at anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, lost, <laughs> like lost in the no, magic. it's a good conversation. Lost in the I, magic. Maybe the the thing that I'll kind of leave you with here is this is there are this is the link to the GitHub repository for OSS Compass. So if you have things specific to OSS Compass, again, this is not a chaos project, so post them post them here. Um, I think that's about, about it. Um, so I think maybe the, the last takeaway was, this is just to show you, you know, like as we come up with metrics models in the chaos project, this is our metric model, um, spreadsheet that we use within the chaos project. These are the compass appears to be a, a really useful tool as a way to kind of rapidly deploy these and, and see them in practice. Good. All right, I'm done. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. I think you also have the next agenda item. I do. So as while I'm here, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that Anna has been talking about with respect to the to do book project is that different groups can come up with uh, different chapters. And one of the things that we have talked about in this group is how um, models can help an OSPO consider or define uh, value within their organization. So I was just looking for some preliminary feedback from folks as to whether or not this might be a useful chapter to move forward with. And we would essentially set it up around three things. So models to help an OSPO consider their value. So these would be folks like working in the OSPO and different metrics models, like what we just saw that could be helpful for, for you um, within the OSPO. Ways to interpret those models. So I think kind of like how Don was talking through the starter project health metric model, that whole conversation, like how do we understand this and why do we care about these particular metrics models would be a really important thing uh, to talk about. And then lastly, like, how do we take, this is again, based on the conversation, here, how do we take what we understand within an OSPO and think about how we communicate that value beyond the OSPO? Like, how do we talk about it? Because what I, one of the things I heard is like bringing, bringing a, like a, a graph or numbers to people sometimes out of the OSPO isn't terribly helpful in terms of the conversation. About demonstrating value. So, how, what what do, what do we need to think about when we're doing that interpretation for other folks? So, this is a proposed template for a chapter. I, I'm looking for feedback, I guess, on the template, and then maybe thoughts about if we like the template or we want to change it, like how we would move forward and kind of filling out some of the content. And you can hate the template too. I don't care. <laughs> Maybe we can make a new one. <laughs> so, I think talking about metrics models and explaining their purpose in open source OSPO work is useful. I mean, I think it's a way of not only providing standard metrics that OSPOs can use to describe the value of the open source assets that a company has, it also helps to explain the value of the OSPO itself and how do you how do you keep track of open source software health you know what are the what are the things that people need to think about you know i think the premise for a lot of these book chapters is to help organizations and people who might be kind of new to this space as well you remember sure. what were they uh, Oh, gosh, do you remember some of the early <clears throat> documents, the early documents that were produced by To Do, like about how set, oh, there's setting a whole a whole series of guides 
that guides. They, the, are still out there. Yeah, the to-do group guides. Yeah, so I think my sense is this kind of falls into that same audience, like helping mm -hmm. folks get a better idea of how to move forward positively with respect to their OSPO in a variety of different ways. And I think this way is about articulating value of an OSPO within an org. Yeah, and I think the other advantage of doing it this way is that the guides were the guides were kind of standalone. There was a lot of overlap. They didn't really like tell an integrated story. So I like the idea of kind of redoing this and putting this together in a book so that they can tell a more, more cohesive, give a more cohesive picture, I think. Uh, Matt, I have a question. Can I ask? Please. Yeah. Uh, so Matt, first question is, uh, when you say ecosystem impact, uh, what does it mean? If you can explain. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, what I was thinking about is, is we have like um, a, a project that kind of exists in relation to a bunch of other projects, both upstream and downstream, how the health of the project that you care about might have an impact within an ecosystem. So if that project failed, and there's kind of like abnormal stabilizing mechanisms that need to occur within a collection of projects that may be related. So that's what I meant by that. Okay, thanks, Matt. So uh, I think yeah, that's clear to me. Uh, I was thinking that one more angle or one may one more uh, dimension could be there uh, from the client impact perspective. Like I work for a service organization where we are work, uh, we are serving so many clients, and if OSPO is not able to deliver the value to some of the clients, then probably OS it will be difficult to justify that why OSPO is required. Definitely, it is internal things with the partners also, we work a lot. So, so many other things are there which you have already covered, but client impact is another one, which probably is missing here, my I suggestion. Love. love it, thank you. Yeah, Jen. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I had, I've been learning is, uh, with books and with some of the um, playbooks and, uh, developer guides that we have is that, um, when people go to them, you know, they're not going to read them front to back. Right. And they're usually they'll, they'll go in and kind of do a search of what they want at that moment for the problem they have and the solution that they need. And so that's something that um, I feel like I also struggle with too, because because we're the ones writing it front to back. And so we're like, it all goes together. And, and I appreciate Dawn's comment on making it cohesive because you, you can't have one part without the other. And so when I think about this chapter, I'm thinking, how do I get to this chapter? And it might be that if I'm in the to-do book, in the to, yeah, if I'm in this to-do book, I might go to the maturity model to say, or the maturity uh, levels and say, I'm at this maturity in my OSPO and I need to demonstrate value, but then I, how do I then get to this chapter for where I'm at in my maturity level, I guess. Um, so that's what, that was just what was kind of running through my brain as I was thinking through this. So if I add a few things like on this, uh, should be should this chapter be like, okay, what are the things that looked at the early stages of the development of OSPO? What are the things that should be looked as a value in the middle stage and in the like mature stage? That's how I understand the comment from Jan. Yeah, like using a maturity model framework, okay. which I kind of put together. I think right. that's a really interesting way to look at this because if you think about um, if you think about the value of an OSPO kind of overall, a lot of them start with one thing being the value of the OSPO. So frankly, a lot of them start with compliance. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that was kind of how VMware's OSPO started. Um, a lot of them that I know start with start with compliance because that's that's really important. You have to get that right. The licensing stuff isn't optional. Um, 
And so the value of that OSPO is kind of around like complying with licenses. And then as, as the OSPOs evolve, they often pick up, you know, additional things. So now, you know, in VMware's case, now we're also responsible for, you know, a bunch of strategic things and looking at business models and, you know, alignment across, across projects. So there's all this other stuff that now we're showing a different value for our organization. But to Chan's point, I think a lot of that has to do with where where are where an OSPO started and they start in different places and how did they mature? I'm not sure how this fits, but I think it's an excellent point. Yeah, I, I yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I agree. Go ahead, Gary. I was I was just going to jump in and um, say kind of the same idea of maturity, but I was trying to figure out exactly how to phrase it that. Um, maturity feels like almost the wrong word to say how you pinpoint what value is being produced, because I think, uh, to your point on like many OSPOs start for the, the compliance or, uh, vulnerability aspect, especially post log 4J, but we probably see them mature in very different ways. Uh, and they start to share some responsibilities and that's why to do and chaos is so interesting is because you see what the overlap is based on industry and based on the atmosphere at the company. So it might be like less of a, how long have you been in the OSPO and how mature is your OSPO and more like what problems are a problem for the business and what kind of value do you need to deliver to stay viable within that business, right? Um, like, I think that, that idea of um, the value proposition to solve a business problem is one way to think about maturity models as opposed yeah, to like and how, how do you them. evolve your OSPO to fit the needs of what the you know what the company needs from you over time right yeah no I would agree I think it's less about maturity but more about more about evolution and making sure that you're solving the right business problems This is helpful. Um, other comments? Uh, I've shared a link which, uh, in which the, uh, this paper has written exactly the similar way, but looking at the, not at the OSPO, but as an open source in general, that how different uh, projects or organization can look at the open source in the different phases of the maturity. So we can adopt something similar model like uh, for this chapter. I'm also wondering, based on this conversation, if uh, like how that would change some of these, that it might be more about problems. You know what I mean? It might, instead of defining impact, it's addressing problems. I think it's more about alignment, like aligning with what your business needs. Um, and in some cases that's going to be impact in some cases that's going to be solving problems, but I think, I think maybe strategic alignment with, with the business might be the right approach. Yeah. Like I, I'm thinking of partner impact would probably just have like subcategories of like what impact you would expect to have with what approach, like. Maybe you're working with the security engineering team and addressing vulnerabilities. Maybe you're working with legal and they help you recommend licenses based on the needs of your organization. Like, I think that you can definitely fill out each of these headings um, with those problems um, and kind of say like, almost like case studies or approaches that you might use to solve those business problems. But I, I think, you know, the headings aren't bad. It's just breaking it down into subcategories there too. It's good. Would it make from a structural perspective, let's pretend that I, that we just had internal alignment as the header. Would it make more sense to talk about say internal alignment, talk about what are, is important when thinking about interpreting models with respect to internal alignment and then how you would talk about internal alignment within an organization. Like we, we kind of frame it like as a silo around the alignment issue. Like right now I have like, here are the things that you would consider in your OSPO, like these things. And then here's how you would kind of think about all of these, all of these things together. You know, here are the kind of important considerations against each of these considerations. 
And then here's how you communicate them. So it's kind of built on um, how you think about things inside of the OSPO and then how you communicate outside. Would it make more sense to say like, internal alignment like within OSPO as, does that make sense? It's just a, it's a, it's kind of responding to Chan's comment that folks might just look for one thing. <laughs> They're just, all they want to talk about is say partner alignment or client impact or whatever it might be. That's what they care about at the moment. So just tell me the story about how I talk about client alignment is what I'm, that's the only story I care about right now. The, the one thing that I think, I think maybe is missing, and this is where, this is generally where I try to start when it comes to, um, you know, looking at the value of an OSPO is, um, I, I think the right place to start, especially if you're drilling down into metrics, is what is the overall strategy for your organization and how does this all fit within it? Um, because internal alignment, that's, it's going to be different depending on what your organization is trying to do. And if you don't have that alignment with your OSPO, like if your OSPO isn't aligned with what the company actually cares about, that's a really quick way to get your OSPO just sort of cut under-resourced um, something because you have to be, you have to be working on the things that the, the organization thinks is important. And so that, that's where I try to start with these discussions. It's like, figure out what your organization needs, figure out how the OSPO fits within it, and then you can figure out, you know, how to how to communicate all of this to the executives so they understand how important it is, and where do the metrics fit in so that you're actually measuring the things that they care about, and that you can talk about them in a way that aligns with what the executives think is important. I think I have a. I have a talk or some blog posts or something. Yeah, yeah, you're ready to rock and roll now. <laughs> do that for me. <laughs> I I do I do have this in in a talk or a blog post or something. So so don't let me forget to send you that. You've probably seen me talk about it. Um, I'm gonna guess. Can I ask a silly question? Yes, it, please. No, I mean, we not love silly, silly questions. Um, I'm just mostly thinking about this particular chapter as it relates to the broader book and recognizing this is just one part and that, I don't know, I guess I guess for me, the concern is just, I'm not sure how the rest of the book is framing all of these things such that I know if each chapter is written by a different group, it's all gonna be like, and this is how we're framing this conversation can be, like, I'm not sure how much we should be building on established principles and frameworks that the book has set up versus, I, I like the idea of writing it in a vacuum first. What, what do we think is constructive and how to phrase it constructively to possible readers? But at a certain point, this does have to fold back into a larger document. And I don't know, like, I think it, I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel in too many places that would cause conflicts to alignment to earlier parts of the book. So I guess maybe, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself a bit, but I'm just kind of curious, are there any existing principles, frameworks, or approaches that the book has already laid out before they get to this, a reader might get to this chapter that we can just build on or frame these conversations in relation to whatever those things are, um, just to make it more cohesive, but maybe I'm getting ahead of us in terms of where we are in this. No, that's a really good point. And I'll be honest, I haven't looked at the outline for the book in a while. And there may be already a chapter about like the strategy for your OSPO and how how to, you know, I don't know, how to map it to your organization's strategy. I don't know. That that could so, even be like a chapter. Or like you the, said, there could be other frameworks we should tie into. Is there know. is there a document that frames guidance for chapter authors like on structure and topicality? Like, is there a central coordinator of the book? Like, I know that's Anna to some extent. Yeah, Anna, I think to the full extent is coordinating the book. And like, then, when I've, I've edited three books. And whenever you edit a book, you want to give the chapter authors some kind of framework or outline. So this, there's some kind of coherence across the chapters, whether it's just structural or topical and structural. So there is a repository where these discussions are occurring. And I think most are posted in issues right now in terms of book chapter ideas. Mm -hmm. I don't have it real handy in front of me. That's cool. 
so my my intention was kind of if we were to like say like these points one through four or however we end up presenting it i mean i would post it as an issue first and say how does this sound even to anna so kind of to your point sophia um not just writing in a vacuum um but i can also post an issue that kind of speaks to your question sean about is there an overarching structure yeah. and how do we even to your point don like how do we see those because <laughs> if there's something that we need to tie into that would be useful to understand what that thing is whatever it might be um so for example if there's already talking a chapter talking about that points one and two you know what i mean understanding the strategy within your organization yeah. and and then our chapter could really focus on three and four I think it might be worth going back to Anna and yeah. Yeah. providing her with, because I'm going to guess this is the first book she's edited, maybe mm -hmm. providing her with some ideas, best practices, some feedback on what you've seen work well um, in the past. And maybe also as a part of that, get a better understanding of what the overall I frameworks ideas are and see if we can align this better. To I'll Sophia's post an point. issue just so everybody can kind of see the response too. So I'll I'll do that. Cool. A little later this afternoon. Okay, um, thank you. I, I'll stop here because I know we're, we have one minute, so. So we are out of time almost. I am gonna add the project viability assessment discussion topic to the next agenda item. So Gary, this actually came out of, I think you were in a newcomer meeting or something. We're asking some questions about this. And we thought it might be interesting to talk about in this particular group. So I'm sorry we didn't get around to this. But if you have other specific questions, if you want to add those in the notes, and then we can also make sure that we talk about them in the next meeting, that would be helpful for me. Uh, this is how you get me to come to the meetings. You keep pushing my agenda item. No, just kidding. Got it. Also at the top. top <laughs> bingo, bingo. Week. Yeah. Uh, it's maybe. also kind of flagged oh. as a topic for discussion at ChaosCon next week, if you are planning to go to that. Um, the session I'm leading is around sustainability, but spoiler, a lot of it is sort of understanding whether or not we're talking about ecosystem sustainability versus project viability and trying to think about those two spaces separately. So I am going to sort of feed that into the discussion plan for next week, which is not part of this particular meeting, but it is part of the extended chaos discussion groups. I will be virtually attending, so I will absolutely make sure that I attend your talk. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'm happy to talk about it when everybody's back. Well, thank you. Um, the other thing we put on the agenda that we probably don't need to talk about, but the for your calendars section. So there are some ChaosCon at OSSNA, some other great talks on topics related to OSPOs and metrics at OSSNA. Feel free to add your favorite talk about this that I've forgotten to add. And then the other thing I just wanted to very quickly mention is the um, FOSSI CFP is um, closing May 14th. So they don't necessarily have an OSPO track, but they do have um, community tracks and some things kind of related to what it is that we do. So that's in it's an event in Portland in July. So, so think about if you want to submit to that because it closes quite quickly. Um, and if you have any ideas for um, what we should put on the agenda for next time, feel free to drop those in here or start the agenda for the for the next meeting. Um, we really do want those to be valuable for people. So please, you know, please add your your things that you want us to talk about. That would be that would be great. Okay, now we're over time. Um, thank you everybody for attending. It was great to see all of you and I hope to see uh, a bunch of you next week. See you next week, Don, or everybody. I'll see you next week. Thank see you. some of you next week. See the rest of you in two weeks. Bye everybody. Bye.